We knew that you could divest invest as a foundation and should, particularly if your mission is it has environment or human rights in it, you should because of the climate crisis that's upon us. But actually, climate affects the mission of any foundation. So, you know, there really was an ethical imperative to look at whether our investments and our grants are aligned. But we felt that philanthropy should be a sector of this exploding social movement and should be out in front because philanthropy has a kind of social capital that it can um, help change debate and discourse on an issue. Philanthropy could move its portfolio quickly and actually begin to create a market for fossil fuel products, fossil free products, um, and then create a track record to show that you could have an effective uh, investment portfolio that was both divested from fossil fuels and investing in the energy sources and jobs of the future. Right now, we have well over 165 foundations around the world that have committed, signed a pledge to divest their investments from fossil fuels and invest 5% of their assets in climate solutions. And I think that's an unprecedented number, actually, because philanthropy rarely collaborates. It sometimes collaborates in grant making, but certainly has never collaborated on something on the investment side of the house. So I would actually say I think it's been a remarkable success. There's um, a lot of factors that lead foundations n n to not want to do this. And the one that I think is most interesting and I think could change the quickest is that the foundations don't have the skills or philanthropy doesn't have the skills to integrate the investments and the grant dollars into a organic approach to the field, right? They don't have the skills. You have staff that are hired to run the grants, and you have staff that are hired to run the investments, or you outsource it. So when you call the question about what is the theory of change of how the investments play a role in the mission, which, frankly, you're a chair, you receive charitable tax status to serve the public good, so I think it's a mission level responsibility, fiduciary responsibility to ask the question, are your investment, investments serving the mission or not? Um, but once you ask that question and you engage all of the staff and all of the players and the board, things change very, very quickly. So I think part of the cultural piece of this is a deeply ingrained belief that if you apply any filters of any kind, any values of any kind to your investment portfolio, it will cost you performance. And that's certainly come up with virtually every institution that's been debating whether they should divest from fossil fuels, whether they can proactively invest in uh, new energy sources or, or any other of a number of kind of new or um, important industries. And I would say that the evidence speaks otherwise. Um, I was just at a wonderful presentation at the UN by Jeremy Grantham, who did 90 years of analysis and said you could exclude any sector from your investment portfolio and it would have a negligible impact on returns. Could even have a potentially positive impact. So we, in this instance, have been able to do very well financially by being aligned with our mission. But I would argue that that shouldn't be the only measure. That first of all, we're a mission-driven institution. We receive charitable tax status to serve the public good. And there is nothing that says that we have to maximize performance. We can have solid performance and achieve our mission and I also believe that there, is, uh, there are many myriad of ways that you can achieve f the financial returns you want alongside your social returns. So once we made the decision that we were going to um, overhaul our investments to be, to be as consistent with our mission as possible and still 
uh, produce the kind of financial returns that we need to operate the foundation and make the kind of robust grants that we want. Um, we started a process where we delved very deeply into what we don't want to be invested in, the kinds of things we do want to be invested in, the amount or percent of capital that we want to invest in highly transformative ways where we're willing to accept a lower rate of return and still have an integrated and balanced um, portfolio. We've been doing this now for eight years, eight or nine years. We've had tremendous success. Our returns are excellent, beat our benchmarks, so much so that last year in 2017, we made such a significant um, uh, set of returns that our board committed to plunge them all right back into our grant making. You can take some risks on returns for a portion of your portfolio. You can invest in industries that you think are crucial to solving world problems prudently. And you can get out of the things that are really against your mission. And if you do it in a careful uh, way, thoughtful, analytical way, you'll get the returns that you need. And I think that last sentence is one I'd want to emphasize. You will get the returns you need. And more and more donors are looking at impact investing as a way to really contribute to their social change agenda. And that's great. Um, but it's not without risks and concerns. And we have to go in wide-eyed and understand what the concerns are, what the risks are, and understand that that's always been true with philanthropy, right? With our grant making, we take, we take risks. We should be taking risks. We should be experimenting with what um, methods of social change. And so I, I think it's okay that there's risks, and I think it's okay to accept that there's risks. However, what's not okay is to go in and think that all impact investing is the same and that it's a panacea to solving world problems or that it is somehow preferential to the kind of grant making that we do, the, the bread and butter uh, donations to organizations to help seed and grow and scale social change. I think first and foremost, we need principles to govern the impact investing space. That principles and, and good practice and examples of good practice, principles being that impact investors have to be clear about what the community participation is and the community benefit is right from the get-go. That has to be an explicit component of an impact investing project. Now that's not easy. What is community participation? It's gonna differ dramatically across issues, geographies, types of communities, but that has to be a principle going in. If you're making grants without any eye to who's sitting at the table and who represents the communities that are ostensibly the beneficiary of these grants, that's gonna be a failed grant making strategy. And, and you know, we all have them and we all learn from failed grant making strategies. So we're gonna learn from failed impact investing strategies. But I, I really do think it starts with principles. And I think this sector is exploding very, very quickly. And we're getting out ahead of or before really engaging at the principled level of what does it mean to do impact investing and who's the beneficiary. If we align what we're doing with our grants with the impact investments with a strong theory of change that communities and often women leading communities is where magic happens. That it's really the alignment of the community designed um, initiatives, strong leadership, a powerful gender lens on a project with philanthropic capital, investment capital and grant dollars. We have some good track records of magic happening and the potential for transformative impacts is actually very great. And that's one of the reasons why our foundation is focused on um, a rather uh, turgid phrase of gender lens investing. And let's put the 
the vernacular aside and say really what it's about is understanding that every investment you make has to be analyzed for the impact it has on women. Because when women are accounted for, the results go up. It is that simple. And there's decades of documentation of that. And yet somehow we still don't incorporate that into our analysis of investments, into our analysis of grant making, that a gender lens is gonna enhance impact. And, and, and enhance, that impact means you're not just building women's leadership, but you're transforming communities.